If you thought we had a lot of impactful speakers thus far, just wait till you hear our keynote panel here. Uh, we are led here by our moderator, Dr. Scott Gardner from the Naval Postgraduate Program in California. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Gardner. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, before I introduce the panel, I want to kind of set the context for a little bit, particularly since this is the, this is the, this the last this is the... session that we have. Um, when I set context for a discussion like this, um, I like to think of it as a pyramid, kind of starting at the bottom with the broadest and then going to the top where it's more specific. Um, so we start out with uh, women, peace, and security. Why are we here discussing women, peace, and security? Um, at the Naval Postgraduate School, and I know also at the Naval War College, we, we typically answer that question by asking three additional questions. First, how does this contribute to war fighting? And WPS, as we've learned over the last day and a half, contributes substantially to improved war fighting. It can help us obtain better decisions, it can improve the execution of outcomes, and it can play a substantial role in recruitment, a major challenge for many militaries, especially the US military these days. The second question we ask is how does it impact the war fighter? Again, we've learned over the last day and a half many ways that can, it affects the war fighter. One is we could think about gender optimization, the idea of having a meritocracy and getting the best war fighter for the critical position, the right person for the right job. That's critical. If you exclude 52% of your population, you're less likely to optimize than if you include them. The second um, notion from the keynote yesterday that I heard in my, my head is kind of you practice how you play. That if you develop at home or within the military or within your organization a system that is exclusive, that is restrictive, um, and that is not empowering, then when you go out and you act, you will emulate that. Right? That how your household is, to, is set up is how your nation is set up. How your organization is set up is going to be how your actions unfold. And so if we want war fighters to be able to optimize what they're doing, we want them to come from a place of strength to be, execute, be able to execute strength as well. Then the third question we ask is, what's right? What's the right thing to do here? And clearly, being inclusive, having a system of meritocracy, equity, supporting positive is the right thing to do. So I think there are a lot of good reasons that here at the Naval War College, here at the Naval Postgraduate School, we're talking about studying, thinking about, hoping to act on women, peace, and security. Um, how come this panel? Why are we talking about NPS visionaries? It's kind of pretty, uh, I don't know, extreme? Not extreme. A little bit of hubris maybe in it, you know? Uh, what's with that? Um, and I think the idea is the, makes it so critical is the following. Um, the Navy in particular is often called a platform-centric service. We care a lot about stuff, ships, boats. Um, and when you have that discussion about platforms, people say, oh, but people, people are important. And you're like, oh, of course, people are important. They drive the ships, man the boats, all that. People are important, yes. But there's a third topic that frequently doesn't get included in that, and that is ideas are important. It's ideas that shape the engagement of the people in the platform. Uh, before World War I, there were submarines, but no one had thought of using the submarines to sink cargo ships. That turned out to be kind of an accident. A U-boat captain was able to sink a couple ships off of Great Britain because they couldn't find warships. That idea that that captain had totally changed the way the submarine warfare occurred and ended up bringing the United States into the war, maybe tipping the balance. Um, it's an idea. We don't remember the person. The platform ran on paraffin, ran on wax. The platform was not impressive. It was the idea that was the key. So when we're talking about women, peace, and security, the stuff, the policies, that's all very important. The people, absolutely critical. But the ideas, the catalysts, the goals, the vision, that's essential to understand as well. And at the tip of our pyramid, we have, well, why these people? Why do we have these three panelists? 
And the short answer, bottom line up front, is we have three rock stars. Um, and now let me tell you why that statement is not hubris. Um, across from me, we have Ambassador Chowdhury. He's the former Undersecretary General and High Representative of the United Nations. His legacy and leadership in the service of global community are boldly imprinted in his pioneering initiatives. In March 2000, as President of the UN Security Council for the political, and, he was critical for the political and conceptual breakthrough leading to the groundbreaking UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. If women are engaged in mediation around the world, it's because of 1325, and 1325 is because of this man. You can see it on his pin on his thing. In September 99, he was critical to the adoption and landmark declaration and program of action on the culture of peace by the UN General Assembly. So. We're also joined online, both behind me and in front of us, by Ambassador Hunt. She's hosted negotiations paving the way to the 1995 Dayton Accords during the genocidal Bosnian conflict. Um, I was recently in Bosnia and I discussed the Accords in addition to the war on a daily basis. Um, Subsequently, she, brought to Harvard's Kennedy, she was brought to Harvard's Kennedy School and has worked in Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Rwanda, and numerous other conflict zones, connect those, connecting those in top political and military positions with women leaders equipped to be at negotiating tables where they've tripled the life of a peace agreement. And then next to me is Brigadier General Cooker Murphy. She's the space, U.S. Space Command's Deputy Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policy and Senior Representative for Women, Peace, and Security. Her goal is implementing this effort as a new combatant command and the newest operational domain uh, for USSC to embrace the opportunity to set a different course that models the kind of environment we want to see everywhere when it comes to workforce development, diversity, and inclusiveness in decision-making and operations. So, very impressive panel. We're going to set this up as a little differently than what we've done before. We're going to try to make it more of a discussion. And the vibe we want is that um, we're sitting here around the kitchen table. Uh, we've got Ambassador Hunt on somebody's iPad. And we're going to have a discussion. And you're just going to happen to see the discussion around the kitchen table. It's actually a very large kitchen. Um, in Central California, my kitchen table is literally not, well, I don't have a kitchen table. It's my kitchen so small. Um, <laughs> so you're going to have to bear with me as I imagine this, too. I'm going to start off a little clunky, a little fixed, and then we're going to have a general discussion. I'm going to start off by uh, asking each of the panelists uh, to talk about their vision of WPS, starting with Ambassador Chowdhury, then going to the general, and then Ambassador Hunt. And everybody will kind of speak their piece about interruption and all that. After that, we're going to have a discussion, and then we'll take some questions from you and from uh, online. And in those questions, we'll both answer them, but also use them as catalysts for additional discussion. So the idea is for this to be a little more lively. It's kind of the end of the day, the end of the session, um, and uh, a little less formal than some of the other efforts that we've, we've had. So, Ambassador, what's your vision for women, peace, and security? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. I am very delighted to come here at Newport at the U.S. Naval War College <clears throat> for the second time. I came here in 2022 uh, for the same topic, to come here with Ambassador Hunt uh, joining me and I joining her, her. And if I was asked last year about the question that I asked, what is my vision? And in the immediate term, I would say this conference was my dream, in a sense that in such a comprehensive way, in a two-day event, you are discussing all aspects of WPS and its potentials. And so that, that is a wonderful thing. But I, to be more uh, concrete in my vision, I would say that uh, I believe that I will be, my soul will be resting well if I find the world accepting 
the point that women's equality makes our planet safe and secure. Sustainable peace is integrally linked with women's equality. So these are the basic things that I would like the world as a whole to accept. In 2014, uh, there was a, a WPS agenda related initiative taken in London. And there we, our slogan was, if you are serious about peace, take women seriously. And that is the point that we would like or everybody to feel. And here also, we, before coming to this room, we discussed. And I think that is a very important element that I would like men to be equally engaged in promoting WPS agenda. I think that is very important. And women's equality, women's empowerment is not just for women, it is for humanity as a whole, for all of us, because it does well to this world uh, when we treat them equally and empower them uh, with uh, opportunities. So that is the very important vision that I would have. And also, um, on, a, on a concrete term, um, United Nations has 193 members. And WPS National Action Plan for each country of the world is rec re recognized. And recognized as a, as a mandatory thing because Security Council resolutions have that capacity of being mandatory for each member state of the UN. What happened, there was a slow movement and next year we are going to have 25th anniversary of 1325. And now we have 108 member states, 85 more to go to prepare their national plan. So I believe that another vision would be next year on the 25th anniversary, we have all countries of the world covered by WPS National Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Same question. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me here. I definitely feel a little outclassed. I'm not sure I, what, where I see myself fitting into this talk is we have the beginning of WPS, experience with WPS, and maybe the newest application of WPS with US Space Command. So uh, this conference has been tremendously helpful in, at least for me, and have a team of folks here as well, thinking about how we move forward with WPS in an AOR that currently has no more than 10 people in it at any given time, uh, you know, on the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station. So in many ways, uh, as General Whiting likes to say, space is not unique, but it is special. We do have a couple different things about us, and we can maybe take advantage of those. Um, it's also a great opportunity to be in Newport. This is a beautiful place. I'm envious of all of you spending all this time here. Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, you all are shaping, you and the audience and the people that have spoke here today are really shaping the vision for U.S. Space Command in WPS. Because again, we're taking away so much from this conference. And it is the beginning. We're at, a, we're at the baseline of trying to implement in our AOR. So there's a great opportunity to take all the ideas we get here and find ways that they, that they, that they fit. Um, some of the good things about our AOR is we don't have any of the problems that other combatant commands face in their AORs. There's no, there are no cultures there, again, just a few astronauts, um, but I wouldn't call that whole cultures. Uh, we don't have conflict in the AOR yet. We have steep competition, but no conflict. Um, we don't have 
organized crime there yet, thankfully, you know, that, that can hold people at a disadvantage. Uh, so, you know, we have an opportunity to do this right from the beginning and try to avoid all those ills and overcome. We don't have to overcome pre-existing challenges. We just have to figure out how to implement the program correctly. The other way that we're different is that there's already an expectation that in space you will seek peace, right? The Outer Space Treaty says that space is for all humankind um, to use equally and to benefit from. And that is one of the, you know, as a combatant command, of course, we have guidance coming down to us from the National Defense Strategy and the National Military Strategy, and we have combatant command objectives. But we are also shaped by the National Security Strategy and the National Space Policy that say that, you know, we have to defend space and keep it peaceful for everybody who wants to be there. That is the end goal and the end result we're looking for. Because space is important in peace, we use it all. I see space contributing to the opportunity for the rest of the combatant commands to use WPS because we can give you you know, visualization, we can give you information, we can give you communications, and we actually can be connective tissue for disadvantaged parts of the population, like women. If they can't be a part of what's going on uh, visually or, or visibly, I should say, you know, there's an opportunity to reach them if the rest of their society lets them to reach them, you know, through space-enabled capabilities, educating girls, you know, um, giving people uh, telehealth opportunities. Those are all things that space can bring to this discussion that we should capitalize on and try to make better for everyone else. Um, peace, or I mean, space is also important for maintaining peace. Again, we kind of understand what's going on and we can try to ensure that uh, the rest of the AORs have everything they need to, to know what's going on and try to maintain that peace. We'll contribute if we have to retake that peace, right? So we're, we're here for that. And then, of course, the restoration. And all of the discussions this, this last couple of days have been about including women in that process and making sure that we are getting kind of a diverse approach, you know, to these solutions. Um, so it's, in many ways, it gets to the core of what we believe, which is it's all about teamwork in our AOR. Many of you probably heard the famous quote from General Raymond, space is hard. It is hard. It takes a creative, a creative team to come up with solutions. And when you're in that AOR, when we do finally get people out there in mass, um, you can ask any astronaut. It's all about teamwork. You've got to work together. And the smartest teams, if they're comprised of a mixed group, including women, then those are, that's who you want because space is really hard. But we focus at U.S. Space Command on teaming and partnering. So again, this is a great opportunity for us to bring WPS into the conversation early with partners. Uh, a lot of nations want to partner with the United States Space Command in order to grow their own space capabilities. Most of those nations see space as kind of a dual-use thing. It's not just a military capability, but it's an economic boost. It's good for their, uh, their nation in many ways. Uh, so they would like us to help them build their workforce to model good behavior for them. If WPS is something we find in common with like-minded nations, we can build off of that. We can use that as almost like an entry-level criteria for who we partner with. We, I've learned much in the data discussions about how you look at a country and decide if that's who you should partner with based on stability issues and where you think they're gonna go in the long term. I don't think to this point that at US Space Command we have done enough of that kind of data analysis with the countries that we uh, seek to partner with, but I do know that our four-star, General Whiting, is interested in making sure we're partnering with enduring-type relationships, and I think WPS can be a foundation for that. Um, finally, I want to say that I really took a lot away from Amb Ambassador Nelson's comments yesterday about this is a strategic competition of values where WPS actually fits in. Um, and I would say that space, again, it is the future, and we're better in the United States at implementing a more diverse thought process, including women in our thought processes, but we can be better and we should work on that. Uh, we want to be a preferred partner, so we need to model this behavior. We need to do well. We're doing pretty good. There are a lot of women in the space community, um, and I think that space separates itself from other combatant type capabilities or military capabilities because it doesn't have the same physicality if you will, it's all about smarts. It's all about what you can be doing, you know, with thinking through a problem. And we've seen where women can bring a lot to that mix. Um, and we always talk about people being our, our strength, our, our innovative people being our strength. 
uh, I would say that we can energize maybe the rest of the world, those countries that still need national action plans, maybe we can energize the rest of the world around space because it is the future. People want to be a part of space. We should lead with our values, um, and you know, the partners we choose should matter. Uh, so you know, in closing, I just want to say I really appreciate all that I've learned from the, the briefers and the panels so far. Um, it's given us some great opportunities for how we can take WPS uh, to the next level within U.S. Space Command. Thank you. Thank you, General. I think we could summarize a lot of what we heard over the last day to say WPS is hard, uh, <laughs> but necessary. So, very good. Uh, Ambassador Hunt, what's your vision? Hi. First, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for pulling this together and the work you did and, and the Naval War College. I, I have to tell you, just sitting here listening to Admiral Chowdhury, I, it gives me all kinds of feelings of appreciation that I carry with me all the time. But um, Mr. Ambassador, kudos to you. You have been at the forefront. You've been really the father of this movement. And General, you were very helpful to me just now, expanding my thinking, you know, thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have been teaching this for 25 years. You know, I've universities all over the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you took me someplace else. I didn't think that there was another place uh, to go in my mind. And uh, so thank you. I, uh, when I think about WPS, which we actually dubbed as inclusive security, when we in 99 brought 100 women from 10 different conflict areas to Harvard for two weeks, um, the, the spectacular spectacular growth, it's, it's impossible to measure. I mean, when I started teaching at the Kennedy School of Government, I, um, I decided I would call it, uh, <laughs> it was a horrible name, uh, New Models for Social Cohesion in Divided Societies. That's because I was feeling so insecure about being in an academic <laughs> setting. <laughs> anyway, so I went looking for what I would include in the syllabus and what books I would use and articles and research. There weren't any. There weren't any. And by that, I mean none, meaning zero. It's like there had been the women, there had been the wars, there had been common sense about all of this, but there was no research. There were no studies of going into different uh, conflict areas. There were the, the World Bank. I talked to. They said, "You know, we don't have the numbers. You know, you, you, we can't make statements when there's so few women at the negotiating table. We can't tell you if it makes a difference. We think the common sense says." And I think about where we are now. Holy cow! Now, just the fact that meetings like this are happening all over the world, and that we can talk about the national action plans and um, and and you know, Ambassador Chowdhury, how hard it was to get that first one and that third one. And the U.S. was not a leader, was not a leader in there. We were following along. Maybe we were number 13 or 14. I can't remember. But everyone in this auditorium or online knows that the U.S. sets the standard. Do we, do, do we have the highest in a sense of... Um, efficiency and effectiveness no absolutely not but we are the standard that the world sees and so meetings like this and the naval war college taking this on is critical and what you've done at the un critical so the one thing i would say is i came to this idea of the importance of having women in these roles not because i'm a feminist and by the way i am but that is not why I came to it. I didn't do it because of those poor women and how they were being raped. I didn't do it because women's issues are important. I didn't do it for the empowerment of women. I did it because war is hell. War is hell. And it's hell on everyone. And I don't even have to get into it. Is it harder on the women or on the men? That's not the point. The point is that war has to stop. And at any point in time, we have you know, 40 to, to 60 different violent conflicts going on where we just concentrate on a few. And so 
if we were doing everything that could be done to prevent that, that would be the worst news ever. That would be that would be grounds for dismay. We aren't. That's the good news. Ironically, the good news is that we aren't doing everything that we could be doing. We have so much more. Even with all the successes that I'm referencing here, what we have to have is a broad amendment to our concept of foreign policy. And that means it matters big if you have an inclusive process. And it's not because I believe in inclusive processes per se. Do I think they're good? Do I think they're just? Do I think they're fair? Yeah, sure. What I'm saying is there's a reason that if you have women around the negotiating table, you end up with an agreement that's about 17 years of holding, has a chance of holding. And without those women, it's only five years. And with five years, you cannot break a cycle. And the greatest predictor of going to war is if you have already been at war, because you've got to break the cycle. So I come at this putting aside a lot of my beliefs about women and justice and all of that, I'm going straight for how do we stop wars? And we are, we've taken a big, big step, but as long as I hear, as I do, people in political leadership say, oh, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing because women's issues are really important, I know we're not even close because I know what they mean by women's issues. And I know that they don't understand that not having a society or families or a country out of the danger of genocide and destruction like we're seeing right now, that's not a woman's issue. It's everyone's issue. So glad I'm part of it. And I'm glad I'm here with all of you and that you're stepping up like you have. This could not have happened. Ask, ask Ambassador Chowdhury, no way when we started this in 99 and 2000. No way. So congratulations to us all. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. All right. So we're at the kitchen table. We've had the meal. We're finishing up dessert. We're maybe on our second glass of wine. It's very nice. I'm going to start a question that I hope will lead to a discussion. I'll start with you just as a, to kick it off, and then after that, we'll kind of go unscripted. Um, so we were 10 years of, of this meeting here, um, and other schools and other institutions, WPS. We've got over 100 action plans. Uh, my boss is a, is a woman at the Naval Postgraduate School, a retired three-star admiral. Um, her boss is the chief of naval operations, is Admiral Franchetti, is a, a woman. Um, and yet, despite these achievements, um, I think all of us would agree the system isn't where it needs to be, as, as the ambassador just said. The system's still kind of broken. Why is that the case? Why are we able to have meetings, have the right policy, have leaders, and yet still have a broken system? I think if I actually knew the answer to that, I you know, probably would have solved the problem and we wouldn't have the problem anymore. Um, you know, at the risk of sounding kind of cliche a little bit, um, you know, sometimes when you've, when you've been approaching something for a long time and you've tried all kinds of different things and we still haven't quite hit the mark, you have to ask yourself if you're actually solving the right, or fixing the right problem. Right, I, and I think we've talked a little bit about that here. Um, you know, understanding, you know, the root of where we have to make change. Um, and because I, I really loved um, Admiral, Admiral Gorman's comment this morning about the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Right? I mean, it really has to go all the way back, and that's what makes this so challenging because not all countries start at the same place. In this country, I'd like to think that we could make you know, tremendous progress, but everything takes time. You know, you have to change thinking, um, you have to change attitudes, uh, not just behaviors, 
in order to really implement something long term. Um, so I know that really wasn't an answer to your question, but I do think that it's because we're, we've, we've done a good job of approaching the superficial things and we're starting to put all those things in place. Now we're really getting down to changing hearts and minds, even here in this country. Am I right? I get to disagree. Is that what we said? Okay. So, did you, if someone has their wine at the table, I've got two margaritas on the rocks with salt. Okay, and I've ordered a third. So uh, I, I worry about that. I worry about when we say we've got to change the hearts and minds. If we had done that in the 60s, 50s and 60s and 70s on civil rights here and waited and, th and thought that that was the key, we would have had so much less progress than we've had. Do I believe in hearts and minds? Of course I do. But, but the question is, how do we penetrate? How do we get through to the changes? Because often the hearts and minds follow the changes. And it took legislation. It took the, the ending of segregation. It took saying, if you say, uh, if you make a slur like that again, little Johnny, you're out of here. You're suspended. You're on probation, whatever it is. We put down rules. And those rules were very, very important. And so I, I just want to make sure that we don't think, in spite of what I believe, of course, and I hope it's clear that I believe in elevating the role of women. That's not what this is about. This is about the policymakers, the political leaders, the people who are heading up the negotiations of the talks, insisting, insisting that those talks will not happen unless, call it a third of the people around the table are women and they aren't token women and they are there because they have experience in ceasefires, they have experience in negotiations, they aren't they aren't the head of the Ministry of Gender. They are the foreign minister, they are the prime minister, they aren't simply the head of the of the uh, refugee camp. They are the top people in the the, in the uh, economic sector, the financial sector. Now, you can say, well, that's part of the point. We don't have these women. And of course, it is integrated, no question. But there has to be that commitment that somehow or another, we're going to find the most competent women in this country to be at that table. And you know what? You can have a country that has, as I've worked a lot in Rwanda, you can have a country where the illiteracy rate in whatever it is, is let's say for women, it's 70%. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the illiteracy rate is in terms of are there top thinking, educated, powerful women who can be at the negotiating table. You know, I don't disagree with you at all. I think you're exactly right. There has to be some kind of like a forcing function. Um, I, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because actually that was one of the takeaways I talked with um, our team about from a U.S. Space Command perspective. I mentioned that we want to partner broadly with countries. Um, I don't know why we can't, because we, we tend to bring WPS in right now as a way to help them with their workforce development. A lot of countries want to know like how to build a space force or how to build a space economy. Um, and I was actually wondering, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna take this back to my boss and see if he will, you know, implement this, but I think we should expect those countries to bring women to the table when we talk to them about partnering. You know, to just maybe make it part of the, you know, why can't we make that part of the deal? Which I think is what you're getting at, right? I mean, other countries want us to follow their cultural norms. Well, we would like them to follow our cultural norms. And that is including women in these discussions um, and make that almost part of, the, part of the plan as we try to partner. 
the question is, you know, will we be able to successfully do that? It would be very helpful if they're very motivated to become part of the space team. Um, you know, then maybe they'll find a way to make that work. We have seen a lot of countries trying to develop their workforce with more women. They're very junior, so to your point, ma'am, it is difficult sometimes to have maybe the right level, but it's a great opportunity to mentor those, those young female leaders to bring them into these conversations. I think we're going to be a lot more hard-hitting than that. I really do. And I don't think it's about maybe, and I don't think we'll try. There are all kinds of times that we say these are the requirements for these talks or for this program. And I don't think we take it seriously enough. And I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about any one person in this conversation. I'm talking about the times in our creating policies where we say definitively, this is the kind of person we must have. And when people talk about, oh, you can't have a quota, I say, what do you think? How do we decide how many people are going to be in the U.S. Senate? There's a quota. How many decide, you know, how many we're going to have in the House of Representatives? There's a quota. Uh, and, and so we, we back off and we say, oh, well, you know, it's hard to find women who blah, 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 blah. I think that is too easy to, um, to I'm, I'm not, please don't take this personally, but I think we hide behind that as policymakers. And I'll say one last thing because I'm going to talk too much. And that is about culture. What is culture? What does that mean? Ambassador culture, my question now, well, before, let me just finish my said that, that was a pregnant pause for effect, Dr. <laughs> Well, I'm going to shift the conversation over to Ambassador Chowdhury because the uh, uh, women, peace, and security, women are actually more engaged in security than peacemaking. Um, there are more women uh, senior military leaders, um, including the general next to me, across the board, not just in the United States but around the world, than, than women senior uh, mediators for international mediation efforts. What's up with that? I mean, how come... We, you got the, the perfect policy 20 plus years ago. Why haven't we seen the achievements that you hoped to, when you helped instigate 1325? Well, I would say that there are strong backlashes which are coming up or challenging us from moving further ahead. These are the backlashes of patriarchy and misogyny. And these dual scourges have really pulled our societies back from moving forward with equality and empowerment in front of us. And that, I believe that the essential message of 1325 should be seen as one of women's equality of participation. They should be allowed or they should have the right to come and join on, a, on an equal footing with men. I will tell you a little story quickly. In January 2000, when Bangladesh became a member of the Security Council. That month, uh, President Nelson Mandela came to the Security Council to brief us on the Burundi peace process, which he was leading at that time on behalf of Secretary General of the United Nations. And he said, because place in the peace table was actually determined by which people, who have the guns. So all the men with guns will come and talk about peace. And President Mandela, we call, or world calls him Madiba, that he wanted to say, why not? The women are standing outside. You have not allowed them into the, not only uh, into the conference table, but into the conference room also. Um, and uh, they said, no, they don't know. 
what we are discussing, and they have no idea. Mandela said that after the, the formal meeting is over in the evening, I felt like listening to these women. So I invite them to have tea with me in the lawn. And next morning, he goes and shares his thoughts uh, to the conference room. Uh, and the men were saying, oh, that's great. Madiba, you have done a wonderful thinking about this, how to make progress. And he said, don't thank me. It is the women who you are keeping out. They shared these thoughts with me in the evening. And you, you instead of me telling their stories, you should ask them to come and join you. Still, it, it was an <clears throat> eye-opener for many of us in the Security Council. But I think uh, this message should be heard by, listened to by all. I think a place in the peace table for women is absolutely essential. And also to <clears throat> track back, you mentioned about <clears throat> women more interested in security than peace. And as a matter of fact, if you read the title of 1325, it is women and peace and security. So we wanted to put women as opposed to peace and security or as related to peace and security. It's not three elements, it's just two elements. Peace and security is one, because the moment you talk about security, then I think the, the perspective changes. Because mm -hmm. security is seen as a mostly state-based security. Whereas peace and security together is mostly on um, uh, human security. That is what we are talking about. So that, that is, uh, again, uh, more important. But I believe that more needs to be done by the United Nations leadership. They have to really internalize top-level senior officers of the UN are not a deep belief in 1325. So that, that is what I would express my deep frustration. Next year will be 80 years of the United Nations and not a woman secretary general. All nine have been men. Why not? The last time when the election took place, 2016, we have five better women candidates than men. But politics came in, permanent members, veto power came in, and we elected a man. And these days, you get re-elected re just automatically. So 10 years. So we, have, we are now launching the same campaign for a woman secretary general for 2026. And I think that is a must. If UN being the biggest advocate for women's equality fails to do it in their own home, then it's a pity. Okay. So if we're gonna have um, backlash, that means we have to have, I don't know, what is Rizzi Spahn, front lash. You know, we have to have done something that uh, people are responding to, but uh, Ambassador Hunt seemed to suggest that we weren't even doing enough that anybody should be responding it to. So what's, what's the backlash to if it's not actions that are moving the needle on WPS? We're just jumping in here. Yeah. Well, the backlash is, you know, m men had been dominating the scene for so many years, decades, centuries. So the backlash is because they feel that now women are coming up, at least asserting themselves. In many countries, we we'll say for my country, Bangladesh, the, the, the women have um, uh, a, an influence in the policy making. Uh, because of civil society movement and because of the leadership. We have a woman prime minister for many years. Uh, so I believe that this fear 
among men that we are going to lose that the, the capacity to dominate everything is, is really threatening them. And they believe, and now I think even, I, I will tell you, in the even corridors, many people say, we establish a division to look after the issues of women, so-called even women. And they are now on this corridor saying, we need a UN men. <laughs> so, as if uh, men had been sidelined. Men had been in the leadership for 80 years. So that, that is the, the tragedy. That, um, uh, that is why also, as I said, we need to bring, um, make more and more men understanding that it is not just women's issues. It, it is a humanity's concern. Oh, I remember when I was sitting at the dinner table and our nine-year-old son said to me, because I was starting the Women in Public Policy program at Harvard, and he said, well, what about the men and public policy program? And I said, sweetheart, that's called history. So, you know, I wonder, um, so I have a 22-year-old daughter who is, uh, I think, a big activist at heart. And uh, I, I wonder if, and this is kind of a general question for the audience, and of course my kitchen table partners here, um, <clears throat> do we think that some of this is, you know, younger people are seeing the world, they're seeing the challenges we have. I mean, let's face it, in this country, it hasn't just been, you know, women's issues that have, you know, caused debate amongst us, but it's been, you know, just broader societal issues as well. But I think young people are starting to feel very, very much like they don't like to see those kinds of divisions, right? They don't understand why we can't just all live together in peace, right? Um, do we think that maybe there will be a change in society? All this turmoil that we've gone through, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, I don't even know how far you want to go back to say the world's been in turmoil, but do we think there's hope with the younger generation who is now infinitely connected to each other? They, now, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there, which is a problem, but there's an opportunity for there to be a kind of a mass wave of opinion on this, and, and my daughter is one of many who think that the status quo has got to change, that it is not working for us. Is there hope? All right. So uh, I also have a 22-year-old uh, daughter, Berkeley grad, so, you know, being an activist is, is baked in. Um, <laughs> so let's vote. All right. Our, in 10 years from now, will the younger generation categorically change WPS? Who says yes? Hands up. Who says no? I, Hands up. I'm not seeing a whole lot of hands. Let's try this again. In 10 <laughs> years from now, and I'm just going to keep saying this to you actually all participate. So 10 years from now, are we going to see a categorical change? That is not a, you're, what you're talking about isn't an um, evolutionary change, but a revolutionary change, a fundamental change in basic WPS concerns. Who says yes? Who says no? All right, so the, the vote here, uh, Ambassador Hunt, is no. Uh, is that something you agree with? Nah. Uh, <laughs> about, you know, what I was saying about culture and how we wait and, you know, culture has to change, et cetera. Um, my culture is really, really different from my grandmother's. Really different. So the question is, well, when did that change? When did that change? Well, it changes every moment. And I'm not just talking about evolution, Scott, I'm, which where you were making the, the distinction between evolutionary and, and, and categorical. But we become accustomed to something very, very different. And you can't say even when that moment happened. It's just constant because we are the culture. We are shaping the culture. And so it has very much to do with how our next generation is feeling in terms of themselves and not just what ideas they have, but do they know inside 
that they can make that difference. And when you see you know, a situation like the, what's happening right now, let's say in the universities, I mean, I was born in 1950, okay? And I look back on the 60s, and this is really, this is really mild, what we're seeing that, like, you know, right now. And out of that came very, very big changes. The, the chaos can crack open the culture. And that's when you can see very significant change. All right. Thank you. Well, we've uh, enjoyed having our uh, kitchen discussion, kitchen table discussion, and uh, very much appreciate uh, you observing it. Please join me in thanking our panelists.